Today's episode was recorded yesterday with Brian Bea, and I started following him because he looked cool and strong and kind of seemed funny. But then, amidst uh, COVID-19, he started doing uh, even funnier videos where he was doing like log squats and just bringing light to the situation. It was something that I could relate to, and so I brought him on. Here he is, Brian Bea. Welcome to the Lifestyle Chase, Season 2. This podcast features high performers who have found a way to live their best life while balancing their health, wellness, friends, and family. I'm your host, Chris Little. Let's get started. The Lifestyle Chase is brought to you by Yeg Fitness. Yeg Fitness is Edmonton, Alberta, Canada's healthy lifestyle community, creating and supporting active living for all. Check them out online at yegfitness.ca and on social media at Yeg Fitness. Welcome to the Lifestyle Chase, episode 109. I'm joined by the one and only Brian Bea. How are you doing? Uh, I am doing fantastic right now. So what was your first thought when COVID-19 hit? What was your knee-jerk reaction? My first reaction uh, was definitely to, uh, you know, find... Uh, the most information I could uh, surrounding the situation and basically, you know, see how I could take precaution myself. So, uh, I would, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I was watching your social media. I started following you a while back. I kind of follow a lot of people from like the, the hype gym. I follow like Pat Davidson stuff like that. Um, I should say Dr. Pat Davidson, but um, <laughs> basically the way this stuff works for me is I follow one person. I'm like, Oh, that person's cool. And then they tag somebody. And then I look and I'm like, Ooh, who'd they tag? And then if I think that person's cool, then I follow them too. And somewhere down the line, I must've thought you were cool. But then you started doing like log squats and I was like, shit, like, <coughs> this guy is right up my alley. Like this guy is like making lemonade out of lemons. What, what first inspired you to do those crazy videos? Um, I mean, first off I, I've been making kind of outlandish, style content since i was like 12 um but i obviously i came up state um after me and my girlfriend left uh the city almost almost two weeks ago um and i was just like you know what? there's not a lot of equipment here and there is a lot of logs outside so uh i basically just you know said grab the camera and let's just uh, go to town kind of improv the whole scenario but I'm, I have a strongman background, so I'm used to lifting odd objects. So we just, we just went uh, off the cuff with the locks. <laughs> well, I mean, well done because like one thing that I've, I've realized, one thing I've gotten feedback on is like for myself, I'll put out some posts and stuff and some of them, I'm just, I'm just pretending it's my client behind the camera and I'm just going through it that way. But sometimes I'm just like, okay, this one, I'm just going to make somebody laugh because honestly people <laughs> need to laugh right now. Of course. Of course. I think it's an important uh, quality to have when you're when you're doing any type of you know content is just to at least make it lighter, especially in this time. Is just to have a little bit more of a sense of humor for it. Absolutely. So if you were at a party and you had to introduce yourself based on the things you're passionate about, the things that you do for work, how would you introduce yourself? Oh my God, I don't know, man, dude. Honestly, in my introductions are in social scenarios, I feel like are can be botched at times, but I would probably just, um, you know, introduce myself as, as a strength coach and a, and a hobbyist for, you know, photo and video. Um, but you know, I've always considered myself to be pretty eccentric. Um, and many of the things I do, uh, I definitely like to be a little more uh, defiant and, um, you know, against the grain with some of my actions. So it would probably be something a little, a little funny, a little little out there, but then uh, I'd probably ease it and finish it off uh, with uh, some some proper mechanics. Yeah, I love it. Um, who are some people in the industry that you really look up to? Uh-oh. Oh, you good? Oh, we're back. We're back. Okay, so... Who are some people in the industry? We, sa we saved it. We saved Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who are some people in the okay. industry that you really look up to? Um, in the industry, first, I would I would definitely say, 
you know, my first two mentors are probably the, the most inspiring to me. Um, that would be Mike and Richie Altieri. Those are the guys who started, um, my career off in, in 2013. And those guys are both, um, still in the fitness industry lightly. Um, one of them works, uh, Mike works for Orange Theory Fitness. He owns a lot of studios. He, he, he went off into that realm, um, in 2013 when I left, um, upstate and moved down to the city to coach and, um, his older brother, Richie, who's basically the, the old wise one, he's not that fucking old, but he's the old wise one, uh, you know, that has just like tons of knowledge, but just does not flaunt or does not, you know, he's just very low ego type dude. And, um, those guys are definitely my biggest influences. And then I would say, you know, from, a from a educational standpoint, you know, I'm, I'm in extremely close proximity with Pat Davidson. He's just one of the, um, you know, real big workhorses and the boldest out there in terms of strength and conditioning. And you know, I, I watch what he's doing and I've seen it unfold throughout the years and um, to see it continue to take place just because of, you know, his tenacity and his uh, just his bold strategy is really how he has to do it. And it's, uh, it's pretty great to see and be around and to be able to learn from him. So I would definitely say, and, in the field and of, of strength and conditioning and what I learn for myself and my clients, it would, it would probably be Pat as well. So when you talk about your start in the industry, what was life like for you then? Like what, what did your start look like? Did you jump into it? Did you ease into it? So I first was uh, attending college, um, for a bachelor's degree at, at SUNY Oneonta and, um, I was enrolled in a nutrition and dietetics program. Um, I did a semester and a half there um, and I ended up dropping out in the spring. Nope. It was the fall semester, I think. Um, and I remember when I left um, upstate to go to college and Richie, who ended up being one of my mentors, you know, I remember walking out the door. It was my last day at the gym before I went away to school. And I remember him looking at me and saying like, well, if things don't work out, we still will have a place for you. And, uh, you know, I took that opportunity. And when I dropped out, I told, you know, him and Mike that I wanted to be a coach and, you know, they took me under their wing. And I just really, the biggest thing was just the amount of time that I was willing to spend at the gym in the beginning, I was there from, you know, for 12 to 15 hours a day, just learning whatever I could picking up, you know, fucking crumbs off the ground. It didn't really matter. I was just going to spend as much time as I could to learn, um, you know, all of the fundamentals. And they also took me to, uh, you know, seminars. I, I went to the Mike Boyle's winter seminar, you know, that winter. And that was like my first exposure to like, fitness coaches and it was Mike Boyle. So, you know, I really feel like I skipped so much of the trash that a lot of trainers can go through in the beginning to where they don't know where they should be learning information from, um, or they may be learning just bad information. And the first person I started learning information from was one of the, you know, gods of the strength coach industry. So that was, that was really my start. And, you know, I, I, I trained for, couple years upstate um, where I grew up around uh, Amsterdam, New York at this place called Oppenhaus Fitness. And, you know, I had a lot of one-on-one clients, some group clients, uh, group fitness clients, and, um, you know, did certifications like IKFF kettlebell sport. I learned kettlebell sport. Um, You know, I did the certified functional strength coach, Um, you know, obviously got the ACSM, you know, CPT, you know, the generic personal training certification. And all during that time, I was also started to train for strongman, which I've done since, you know, 2014. What kind of got you wanting to do strongman in the first place? So we had uh, Mike, one of our, um, you know, that was my mentor at the time. He had a good friend from high school that lives down in New York City, uh, Troy Valberg. And I actually, fast forward, I actually lived on his couch when I first moved down to the city. That's a fun fact. He was a strongman athlete since like 2011. And he got us 
to get on board and train for um, the, the lift for autism that they would have annually in uh, Wallkill, New York, which was right around Newburgh. And, you know, he got us on board to train for it. And we had all the equipment. We started, if we didn't have the equipment, we were going to local restaurants and getting kegs and filling them up with sand or cement. Uh, we were buying, you know, deadlift frames for cars. Um, and we, we trained for that. Uh, in April of 2014, and we just were hooked. It was so much fun. That's awesome. Um, when you talk about, like, you've been doing funny videos, funny content since you were 12, like, what was your life like when you were 12 when you were doing the funny content? Were you an athlete? What, what kind of kid were you? Yeah, so I was an athlete. I was also a an absolute ADHD, bouncing off the walls type kid. Um, so, like, I did have a group of friends that when we were, you know, 11, 12, we were doing videos like Jackass. We were jumping off of stuff. We were fucking hurting each other. Like, it was, it was pretty much what you would imagine, just reenacting Jackass. So... Did you envision you being in the career you are now back then? Or what was, what was your dreams as a 12 year old? <sighs> dreams as a 12 year old. Well, fun fact, probably when I was like eight, I, I, my dream was to be an ice cream truck driver. That's uh, that was my, that was when, when everyone had their career fairs, dude, it was the craziest thing. I remember I, my, my family always made fun of me for it. Uh, you know, everyone wanted to be a cop or a firefighter. And I was like, yeah, I want to, I definitely want to just like be the ice cream truck driver. <laughs> so what was it about it? Just like ice cream or just the novelty of making, bringing joy to kids? Dude. Yeah. Right. I, I think it was just the fact that I just like, I never put much thought into it. And I was like, Oh, I love when the ice cream truck driver comes around town so I can just do that. Um, but to be more serious, I think, you know, I never really gave, I, I never had a clue, which I feel like a lot of people can relate you know, I never knew where I would, I had no idea where I was going to see myself, uh, especially when I was 12. You know, when I graduated from high school, I went to a community college for a couple of years. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I was, I really love fitness. I really love, I paid a lot of attention to nutrition at the time, which is why I originally, you know, or uh, eventually went to school for nutrition. But, you know, especially from where I grew up uh, and the exposure was so low um, to any of like these real careers. Like I remember just getting like the, you know, you would get the books or the pamphlets or at a career fair and it would show like, you know, you would base what you wanted to do off of like, Oh, the average income of ABC careers. And it was like, not realistic. You didn't really know what the careers entailed. Like, you know, it was just so like, so shallow of a, of a field to choose from. We weren't really exposed to a lot. I grew up in a small town and it wasn't until I moved to New York city, which I realized like there are so many careers out here and so many people doing cool shit that I like, I just never even imagined were a thing like existed. It's crazy, man. How did your life so, change when you made the, the move to the big apple? Uh, well, it changed drastically. I was, I realized I was in a place that I definitely belonged because, um, you know, I responded well to a ton of stimulus and I love to just work really fucking hard. And, um, you know, I, I again, I, I moved in with Troy Valberg, the kid who eventually got us into Strongman. I, I stayed on his couch and shared that couch in a, in a studio apartment, probably 400 to four, uh, 450 to 500 square feet. And we shared that um apartment and you know there was really no there was no wall there was no screen no anything it was close quarters it was such a great time i was 22 years old um you know i learned a lot and sh definitely struggled and did whatever i could to get my business up but um you know new york city just you know if one thing it did it just gave me tons of exposure and I've just been able to learn and everything I've been exposed to, I've just taken and learned from it. And I've just absorbed it all like a sponge. And that was like just the greatest thing I could have done in my entire life. Did anybody like think that you were crazy when you told them, Hey, 
I'm going to go to New York and live on somebody's couch. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, the people, when I was leaving my current job at Alpenhaus, they were trying to offer me a, you know, a better position or a, a more steady pay. And I remember specifically the, uh, one of the coordinators looking at me and being like, yeah, like I heard like, you know, you're going to be living on a couch and stuff. And I was like, dude, well, I fucking, at that time I was like, I was like, what, 21. I was sleeping on couches and floors still. And I visited a college. I was like, you think I care about sleeping on a couch? Like you really, that's going to be your draw. Everyone thought it was a little wild, and I had you know people that were expecting me back to be back in six months, but you know clearly that didn't happen. How did you stick to your guns, or are you just good at that kind of stuff? Just sticking to what you want to do? Oh, I just like, I mean, for me, it like I'm just so accustomed to eating shit. Like, if something's hard, like I'm never gonna be the person that's like, oh, this is too hard. I gotta stop. Like, I'm just always gonna be like the dog that gets hit and just keeps going. Well, obviously, as I've gotten older, I've really picked, I pick and choose my battles. Like, I'm not dumb about it, but, um, you know, I, I just like would work through anything. It just didn't matter. Um, so yeah, like I, I just stuck to my guns by just, being really good. I was really good at what I was doing. I was a good coach and like people were you know, receptive of that. And it just like kept turning. Have you so, ever had another moment in your career so far that kind of reminded you of that uh, instance where you had to like take crumbs off the ground kind of thing? I like that analogy. You that analogy. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I haven't honestly, very luckily for me is, you know, I'm very fortunate that, um, you know, a lot of my progress has been, you know, linear. Like I, I really haven't had that struggle since I just, you know, really picked up and just started my career in the city. Um, but you know, I've had instances where I've had to like, you know, take time away from work, um, and then return, but like nothing crazy like that. I've made linear progress in my business and it's been really great. And I'm at a good spot now, obviously not now for this interim period, but, um, you know, it's been good. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty frugal. I'm smart with my money. And, you know, I, I always make sure that I'm, I'm stable. So. so this industry takes a lot out of a person. Like we're, we're working with people with different personalities, with different emotions, with different like uh, skill sets. Um, how, what, what's your formula for kind of like keeping your bucket full? Um are you saying in reference to like my coaching style or well it's just like so we in ourselves are human so we we need to be emotionally sound we need to be prioritizing our fitness our nutrition and sometimes that goes on the wayside when we are working with other people and when we are having to be up for like 15 hour shifts or or whatever the case may be mm-hmm um, yeah, I mean, so I guess if you're speaking in terms of like, you know, balancing and, you know, recovery, um, definitely, I mean, may not be my, it may not be my strong suit. Um, you know, I've had things happen in the past that, that have, you know, surprised me in, in a sense of where I thought I was doing a great job in recovering and, um, you know, really was working on my, um, you know, my mental health and my, you know, physical health. And, you know, I've had things pop out of the blue where surprise, no, it's not. And, you know, some things that you can't even put a, a finger on, but, um, you know, with long hours in the city, you know, I think it's, I've kind of, uh, sloped down from where I started where I used to work like, you know, 12 to 15 hours at a time. And now I limit myself for like maybe eight to 10 hour days. Um, and, you know, I usually use my weekends to decompress and, you know, take on other hobbies or things that I'm doing. Um, you know, if in terms of recovery, like I like, you know, I take some trips, you know, to the infrared sauna. Sometimes I go to some of the baths in, uh, in the city, which sounds like really weird. Some people go into these Turkish baths, but, uh, it's like, it's actually, I mean, it's, it's enjoyable for me. I, I don't really care if there's sweaty dudes around in their fifties, like, whatever I'm, I'm doing my own thing, but, um, you know, I used to do like some of the cold plunging and, and doing the sauna with people. 
Um, and then, you know, I, I do some, I write some comedy and I, you know, also make content as part of my, you know, decompressing or my recovery or rest time, um, you know, or it's maybe listening to podcasts or anything of the sort. Yeah, I can totally relate to like creating content or being creative in the the decompression stage of things like um, putting out funny stuff. Uh, putting out funny stuff is always a good way to uh, decompress and kind of get back to the to the swing of things. Hey, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, this thing is like I, I definitely. I'm definitely a, a sort of like a, you know, a jokester, but I do take a lot of things you know seriously. I'm, I'm very smart with my work and the things that I do and I'm very calculated. Um, but, you know, I think it's very important to just keep a great deal of humor in the day to day. And that's what I do. I think that just keeps things light for me. So I'm not like, I wouldn't say that I'm stressed out or, you know, in duress over things during the week. I'm really not. Um, you know, it's just general fatigue for me working out really hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That totally makes sense with your business. Uh, what kind of things did you pivot that, uh, changed? Like, did you do online training? Did you jump onto like the spike or Skype, Skype training or, or what was your, uh, transition? Well, I, I used to have a trainerize account, um, where like if I had, I used to have like let's say more clients that like moved out of the city uh, and they wanted to stick with me on a, you know, a tele telehealth some some, t- some type of online training. I had a trainerize account up. Um, I reactivated that and, you know, I've opened that up to any of the public or my clients now um, that want to work on it. So I do use trainerize. It's a good uh, platform that you can put your own workouts on. There's a timer, there's an app, you can put your videos on there. Um, it's a pretty good system, but um, I'm also just doing, you know, FaceTime consultations with some of my clients, um, you know, and some of the other ones, you know, maybe doing their own thing in their own respected, you know, cities. Um, but for right now, I, I, I guess I don't necessarily see, um, you know, the growth of that in this period. It's a little, I guess it's uncertain, but you know, it's, I think a lot of people are still going through just drastic transitions day by day where unfortunately, you know, fitness is not at the forefront of their brain. Um, and they're just worried about, you know, how things are going to be okay for them or their families. So. Yeah, no, that's, that's that's an important thing to, to see it. Like essentially you had the infrastructure in place. So you had your bases covered, which is great. And then it's just a matter of like understanding that like, yeah, we're all kind of like, everybody whether they're in fitness or they're being guided through fitness they're kind of like oh oh shit like what what's happening now and they're processing that so like sometimes it's a great time for for introspection and like self-reflection and stuff yeah i mean it's it's really the only thing you can do i mean there's many ways that you can work on yourself um during this time and i think it's obviously the most important or just, you know, get on some calls with some people they haven't talked to in a while. That's what I've been doing because there's a lot of people uh, that I just don't give the time to during my normal life that I should be. Um, but sometimes I just don't have the time. So I've been you know, communicating with a lot of people that I have not in a long time. Um, but from a fitness perspective, it's tough. Like, I mean, every, it just looks like a circus act right now when you scroll through your feed. Um, I'm making generally the same tone in the same kind of content and i'm just going to continue to do that i got a couple good things in the works that are going to be a little bit more higher production and i'm just like doing what i can on my time to just still do the same shitheads type type stuff on the internet yeah absolutely um what's the biggest breakthrough that you've had as you've been having these meaningful conversations with people that you hadn't talked to in a while or that you have been meaning to talk to I wouldn't say there's any big breakthroughs, but I just, you know, it's good to chat with, you know, some across the country that I haven't really, you know, spoke to in a while and just to check in with everyone at once. It's kind of cool because we, you know, these are friends that I've seen, haven't seen, you know, probably almost a year and it's, a, it's good to be able to get them all together, uh, even if it's on a screen, you know, but, you know, I haven't had any, any breakthroughs. It would be nice if I could, 
you know, come up with the cure to this coronavirus, but I haven't been working on it lately. Man, you're yeah. letting us all down up here in Canada. We're waiting on you, dude. <laughs> yeah, I've just been fucking really lazy, dude. It's my bad. <laughs> my so bad. when it comes to, like, let's say your day is completely empty, what are three things that have to happen in your day for you to just feel like, oh, yeah, it was a good day? Um, well... I'd have to get outside. I would have to get outside and move. That's number one. Um, oh man, for it to be a good day, dude, I would have to eat something absolutely delicious. Um, it was, I mean, I would have to have a good solid meal. I'd have to get outside and move around. And oh man, to make it, to make my day. Um, you know, I. I I would definitely, the third one would definitely have to be to like to assist someone or to help someone. I, I it's, it's definitely part of why I love to do what I like to do. I like to help people. So I would like to obviously assist or, you know, make someone happy in some certain way. That would definitely be, definitely be one of those. Yeah, that's a, that's a good For one. Sure. I think sometimes we forget, like we are in a place where, especially as like people in the fitness industry, there's never been a better time than now to just like genuinely help people. And there doesn't have to be a price tag associated with it. It just can be like, hey, here's a valuable way to uh, keep your nutrition in check. Or here's a valuable way to be active with zero equipment, but just have some kind of routine to keep you keep you sane. For sure. Sure, sure. And you, I mean, part of me, like, you know, when you scroll through your feed and it becomes saturated, you tell yourself like, eh, you know. There's a lot of this. Do I really need to put something out? But it, essentially, there's always going to be a handful of people that are just like, yeah, I really benefited from that. So there's going to be a lot of people that talk shit about it. But I think it's still beneficial to put out whatever you're going to put out, as long as it's not burpees. Yeah, exactly. I'm glad we're on the same page there. <laughs> so when when I think about like content and stuff, because like I get it, where a lot of people are putting out the same stuff and it can get redundant, but that's like we are trainers and we're connected with a bunch of other trainers. So we're going to see nothing but trainers putting out trainer things. But the people who right. see us, they might be our clients that are just, they're kind of like, okay, I need somebody to pony up here and put out like a home workout or like just something insightful or just something that makes me laugh. And so if we do not like go to the call, um, we we're letting them down in, in some way, as long as it's like genuine, like some people are just doing stuff just to do stuff. And they had no like motivation internally to put that out. They just saw somebody else do it. So they wanted to do it too. As long as it's genuine, I think it's always valuable. And we just forget that like, yeah, we're in an echo chamber of other, other fit pros, but like our people are not our people. We are their entry point to living a more full life of course and that's the you always have to remind yourself is that you're exposed to your list which is probably going to be 85 percent fitness so you can't really pay attention to everything that's in your feed and have that dictate what you do if you're your own brand and you're you know, creating your own stuff that's you you decide you're the leader you're going to decide and you know the people will consume so, so. Do you remember what your experience was like with your very first client that you ever had? Very first client. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, this was, this is at Alpen house. Um, I had this woman, her name was Lori Taylor. She was, came in. I remember coming up to the desk. I was in the back. I was just like, teaching like a group class or something. I just finished. I came to the front. Someone was like, Oh, there's a lady here. I'm going to give her to you. She wants to train a few days a week. Um, I remember pulling up to the front and she was just like sitting there with her car ready to swipe for sessions. And I was just like talking to her for a little bit. She said, you know, she's just got to get her act together. She's got to lose weight. And I think she was like two twenty at the time, two hundred twenty pounds. And, I mean, it was like, it was like eight, 12, uh, you know, consecutive months. Um, and she lost, I think in, in, by month eight, it was like 55 pounds. She eventually started sitting around at like 162. And um, like, that was like the first major transformation uh, that I, you know, trained somebody through. And like, just that relationship, you know, between me and her, it was just, 
it was very, it was just an amazing thing because like you, you see how somebody changes their lifestyle completely. And, um, you know, she was just down for whatever, what do I got to eat? What do I got to do? Literally the perfect client. Like you, you find this 2% of the time. Um, and you know, she, you know, I still text her from time to time. She, she moved out of Texas now, but I text her from time to time and just like, you know, catch up, see what's going on with her because she was just like probably the most motivated and the most willing to adhere to anything. I taught her, you know, everything under the sun, bells, strength training. Um, and she was just like super receptive and she made crazy, crazy progress. You know, she was forever grateful and it was just like, it was a great thing to see. So what did that experience teach you about uh, being a better trainer or changing you as like the human being that you are? I mean, I mean, it definitely put things in perspective for me for like how, uh, you know, how much weight you know, your actions really can carry. I mean, this woman's life completely changed. And like, it's one of those things where, you know, after a transformation like that, someone will look at you and tell you things and, compliment you in ways you've never been complimented before and say how you've changed your life. And I'm just like, damn, like I thought I was just teaching you not to eat like shit. And just like, it, it would just seem sometimes it seems so minuscule in your mind. Um, but you know, to her, it was huge. It was, you know, astronomical. Yeah. It's, it's cool well, takeaway. Cause we, we kind of reflect on things and it's just like, uh, with the content, it's like every little sentence that we say to a client, like, that's gold nuggets right there. Like they can, they can make massive impact in their own lives with just the little things. And it's just how we say them and the, the way we say them makes a huge impact on other people's lives. A hundred percent. I mean, there's just like, I even think of myself, there's certain cues or, you know, uh, certain, you know, sayings, that like someone may have said to me once and I thought it was so endearing that I just like will always remember those things. And you, you, sometimes you got to give yourself credit for, you know, putting those into the airwaves, you know, for people to, to digest because those things can be really helpful. You never, you never really know until somebody tells you, you know, two years down the road, how you really made a, you know, made an impact. So I would say it's, yeah, it's, it's been really life changing for sure. Can you reflect on any of those moments of impact that you've experienced from other people? Like somebody said something to you and it changed you? Uh, well, honestly, the first thing that comes to mind is one of my high school friend's father said something about uh, how, 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 <laughs> how doing something was like pissing in the wind. And I'll never forget that. <laughs> So I'll never forget that uh, that saying of how like basically when you're trying to like make jumps upstream, it's like pissing in the wind. Um, so that was just a saying that I think is just uh, you know near and dear to to my heart. But uh, I, I guess I would just say you know other other sayings or little cues. I mean, there's a bunch. There's a bunch of them. I, I guess I can't think of any at the moment. But um, sometimes there's just there's just like certain sayings everyone has and that their friends might say, and then you they catch on and it's something that you end up using for years. It's just weird. I guess that's just some things humans do. What's one of your biggest goals for the, the year 2020, assuming all this stuff is wrapped up by like June, July, what's something that you really want to accomplish before the year is done? Who? Well, I mean, I mean, what I know I'm going to accomplish, I have a, a friend of mine, um, Calvin Martin, he's, he's someone I've been coaching with. Uh, he's from my hometown. I've been coaching with him since 2013. We used to coach together at Alpen House. Now we coach together in New York City, and we're in the works of launching our own um, fitness brands, um, lifestyle, nutrition, education. Um, that's been in the works, and now we just have a ton of time, you know, to, to work on stuff and put out content so that's really what we're working on so uh, basically as we we're able to get back to our normal lives in the city you know whenever that may be i'm excited to you know take way with with our brand together and be able to you know spread ourselves out uh, across the city a little bit more in the fitness not damage but I, um 
but we don't know when that's uh, when that's going to be. But you know, I, I just I don't really know. I have a lot of different goals throughout the year. I have a lot of different hopes and aspirations for the fucking world in general. I mean, this is a weird time, and you know, I actually read a really good article that I shared with a couple of good friends about you know how instances like this will permanently change the world and um i actually have high hopes for the way that it can change a lot of the dynamics currently in our country um you know i think just seeing it directly from uh, you know our phones and instagram and you know being in a city which is where like literally is the epicenter of the virus in america and you know i think it was maybe the first week of March where things, you know, people actually started to get a little more worried and stuff. And that's when I first week of March, I was taking precautions. I was willing to take precautions. I didn't care how I looked to what it was sounded like, or people thought I was being a little wimp. Clearly that's not the reality now, but um, you know, you would see people, you know, in my Instagram stories, I'd see people getting whacked at the bars. I mean, it was real. Like people were out getting blasted partying in celebration and you know the same everyone was looking at the same data it's just like everyone talks about like instagram how it's a highlight reel and it's still a highlight reel for many people in these times that they just want to feel better themselves and they want to make other people feel better and they want to dismiss all the bad stuff because you know we can pull up something that tells us there's something good and that's it that's all i needed now i'm going to dismiss the rest and it's just like this weird I mean, Instagram obviously brings like these highlights and this optimism, but to an excess sometimes. Um, and that's like the weirdest thing to say because I'm usually a chronic optimist myself, but there's a certain like obsessive, excessive optimism that like dismisses way too much important stuff that needs to be looked at. Um, and it's just because again, like the past five years of Instagram culture, it's like, here's the good stuff. I just need the good stuff. I need to make myself feel good. And then I'm off. I'm going to do what I want to do because it's me. It's my own cognitive bias. And, you know, I don't know if I'm rambling or not, but this is what I've watched, you know, you just, as I was taking this seriously and still watch for like days and weeks to come where people still weren't taking it seriously, just because they saw one data pack that said, this could be like the flu or one person said it could be like the flu. So, okay, yeah, it could be like the flu. I'm not going to worry about it. But that's not the, – you didn't read into anything. You listened to one person that was making themselves feel good by saying it, and then you felt good say, by saying it. It's just it's just like chain reaction. And I just feel like hopefully after you know, things transpiring like they are now, people will you know, read into things differently, take information differently, or just have more of a trust towards the sources that things, things are coming from at the top. Like there's just been so much um, – just distrust or you know people don't know where to get information from or to read or what they want to read or what they want to hear and you know hopefully all of this kind of you know shocks the system to to make there be uh, just like a more or just like a better understanding of where you know information is coming from and how serious it should be or if it, it is the right information um but you know, now I'm just going out of ramp. That was awesome, dude. <laughs> like that was perfect. Um, I think it's important, and especially we can apply this to fitness with how people source out like what is like science based and what's just somebody air quoting science based. Like, you just see a lot of like mumble jumble out there, and it's just for right. for the greater population to understand some things that are not going to waste their time or their money is going to benefit everybody. Like, there's just too many people jump into sell like solutions to COVID-19 through some kind of a supplement or some workout program. It's like, okay, yeah, I don't think you know how like a pandemic works, you know? Right. It's, it's, it's literally pseudo bro science to a massive scale. Now it's just involving a virus. Like literally <laughs> yeah. it's pseudo science for it's pseudo bro science for a virus. It's fucking Oh, real quick, because make me feel good, and make other people feel good, and just make sure and make them act like they can live normal lives when they shouldn't be. Yeah, no, it's so, true, and it's it's imperative that people it is. that people like stay stay home, like just uh, slow this thing down and stuff like that. When it comes down to a workout in a well-equipped gym, what's your favorite lift? 
Ooh, I mean Deadlift, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Do you, I think yeah, I've I seen that you like barbell deadlift a lot more than trap bar. Did I get that right or did I get that wrong? Oh yeah. We usually, you know, we've been pulling from uh, an Ohio bar or a Texas bar recently. We use the trap a little bit. We bought a trap bar. We used it for a little bit. I really do like the, the, the dynamics of a trap bar, but I'll always love to like rip a bar off the ground as fast as I possibly can. Absolutely. What's your second favorite lift? I want to say honestly, I want to say I uh, log viper press log viper. Nice. I what's, love to just rip the viper bread. What's your favorite uh, source of protein? Are you like a chicken person, or or what are you all about? Dude, this this is the news flash. Go with thighs, chicken thighs all day. I'm done with breasts. I'm on to thighs. I don't care if they have more fat content. It's not gonna. It's not gonna. You know, ruin my progress. Uh, I've been doing a lot of chicken thighs. Yeah, I'm on the same page there. It like improves your like just you feel better because they just taste better, and you just toss some seasoning on there, and you're good to go. It's just they make me happier. <laughs> chicken thighs make me way happier of a person than, than breasts. <laughs> so, so simple. When it comes down to a non-meat protein source, then what's your go-to? Mm, non-meat protein source. I mean, I do have a. I usually have a shake every morning. I have a shake. I'll usually do like a vegan sport or like a vegan. I don't, honestly, I don't. Do you do whey? You use whey anymore? Do you yeah, still I use, use whey. whey. Yeah. I got away from it. I started using like Sun Warrior protein, more of like a plant-based protein, which I like. Um, but other than that, it's like, dude, my, my days, like when I'm on point, I'm starting in the morning with a shake and then I'm having an omelet and then I'm having ground turkey, rice and broccoli. And then I'm, or and then I'll maybe have salmon or steak for dinner and rice and then snack before I go to bed. Boom. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds very relatable. I can relate to most of that with your plant-based stuff. Like what, what kind of, is it mushroom? Is it pea? Like what, what's that stuff composed of for you? Oh, just like what I'm eating for veg, like on generally. No, no, just with uh, when you're getting your protein powder. Because I've seen, I'm just curious. I'm doing some market research on like plant based protein products, and I've seen sometimes gotcha. it's like a pea, like a vegetable pea based uh, protein. Sometimes it's a mushroom based protein. I think I think uh, Sun Warrior is pea protein. I want to say it's a pea protein. Tastes pretty good. Um, it tastes really good. I mean, you know. When you're talking about you know the bioavailability, I don't I don't know I really don't and maybe I should I know that usually what egg protein is the most bioavailable, um, but I really enjoy the pea protein. It doesn't really upset my stomach. Way it used to it started to upset my stomach for a little bit, so I just very simply just decided you know I just I don't want to have an upset stomach, so I'll have the pea protein. Yeah. And like, I have a lot of clients who are like that. So I guess that's why I dove into the question a bit more and like bioavailable, that's like almost over complicating the situation. Like a lot of people right. are going to be in that mode where they have to look at it that intricately. Like, um, if, if they're just getting a source of protein to begin with, then they're winning. If they are, uh, worried about like the intricacies of it, they're more likely to walk away from it than they are to consume any of it at all. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, I just don't think that's anything that needs to, yeah, it doesn't need to be for fully investigated. So I have one final question for you. Um, if you were going to give one piece of advice to someone on how to authentically live their life to the fullest, what would that piece of advice be? Just don't hesitate. I would say just don't hesitate. And that's after like three seconds and a long exhale, I would say uh, don't hesitate because, you know, there's going to be a lot of opportunities. Take them, even if you don't feel confident going into them, learn how to do whatever you're about to jump into as you do it. Um, show up ready to work, ready to rock. Um, I think that's really, I think that's really the best advice I can give to keep it short. Um, you know, I've been able to make the progress I have in my life by just not hesitating and just saying yes. I think Richard Richard Branson was always quoted on quoted on this by saying, you know, figure out how to do the task after, accept the challenge, and figure out how to do the task after. And that's, I think, that's a really important thing to 
to understand and live by. That's awesome. Great, great takeaway for this episode. So thanks for joining me. It's been a pleasure to, to chat with you. Yeah, dude, thank you for having me, man. It was a nice talk. So if you're interested in seeing some of the posts that Brian has made, you can find him on Instagram at Brian Bea, so B-R-Y-A-N-B-A-I-A. And my challenge for you in this episode today is to find one way that you can make somebody laugh and then talk about it in the comments. So there's going to be a post at the Lifestyle Chase and it's going to be the podcast challenge. And yeah, find a way to make somebody laugh and tell me about it in the comments. Thanks for listening. Be sure to check out past episodes of The Lifestyle Chase by going to thelifestylechase.podbean.com. You can find me at Christian Little on Instagram or www.invigoratetraining.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for the support. Catch you next time.